Thanks, Ed, and, and uh, let me begin by saying how pleased I am to be here today and commend the Public Policy Forum for organizing this event. Uh, chairing the expert panel on sustainable finance uh, was a rewarding experience, and, and uh, my thanks to you and your team at, at PPF for all the support you gave us. It was, it was a real privilege to work with uh, Barb Zvan, Andy Chisholm, and Kim Tomasin. And together we met with hundreds of business leaders, financial experts, and organizations across Canada. Uh, in a couple of minutes, Barb's going to say a few words about the expert panel report, and more importantly, about what has happened since it was published. Uh, as, as you mentioned, uh, of course, since the panel submitted its final report, I've taken on a new job with some new responsibilities. And even though climate change doesn't appear in the Bank of Canada Act, uh, I want to underline that the central bank has a clear interest in this issue. The Act, the Act instructs the bank to promote the economic and financial welfare of Canada. And to carry this out, we need to understand the major, major forces on our economy. Climate change and the transition to low carbon growth will have profound impacts on virtually every sector of the economy in the decades ahead. In the decades ahead. So to fulfill our monetary policy remit, we need to understand the implications of climate change for economic growth and inflation. And this is no different than our need to understand other major forces on the economy, like technical change, aging population, or the ever shifting dimensions of globalization. The effects of climate change are also important for the bank's responsibilities regarding the financial system. It's our job to promote an efficient and stable financial system. And this is where the connection to sustainable finance is most obvious. A well-functioning and efficient financial system has the important job of channeling savings to the most productive investments. Finance is not going to solve climate change, but many of the investments and innovations that will are very capital intensive. That's why it's so important for the financial system to steer capital to the most promising sustainable investments. The financial system also has a critical role in helping households and businesses manage new climate risks. This includes both the physical risks associated with more extreme and more frequent weather events and the transition risks related to the revaluation of assets and the reassessment of projected earnings. A stable financial system is one that is itself resilient to these physical and transition risks. And as, is, as the expert panel highlighted in its final report, transition risks are often mispriced and physical risks are generally underappreciated. The longer that persists, the greater the risk of a sharp repricing with the potential for substantial losses for financial institutions. At a minimum, this would impair the ability of the financial system to support the real economy and could even threaten the stability of our financial system. The efficiency and the stability of our financial system in the face of climate change are closely linked and mutually reinforcing. By accelerating climate smart capital flows, the financial system can reduce the risk of an abrupt and destabilizing adjustment. And by identifying, measuring, and managing physical and transition risks, the financial system will improve the allocation of capital. Information and disclosure are essential for the financial system to be able to do its job. Companies need to assess, price, and manage their climate risks and they need to disclose these risks for markets to function well. This means companies must have reliable, consistent, and comparable ways to measure and state their exposures. And financial institutions too uh, need to understand and be transparent about their own exposures. Now, nothing I've said is particularly new, but these issues are taking on increased urgency. So we're, severe weather events are happening more often and with greater intensity, damaging real estate and infrastructure. More alarming still, scientists have confidence, high confidence, that temperatures continue to warm rapidly and this will contribute to more heat waves and increased frequency of heavy rainfall. If we're gonna overcome the threat posed by climate change, we, we the world, need to move faster. There's also another reason for urgency here in Canada. 
How well we address climate change is becoming a competitiveness issue for Canadian businesses. Consumers, workers, and investors increasingly care about the environmental footprint of the products they buy, of the companies they work for, and of the businesses they invest in. And as a result, climate change is becoming an immediate bottom line business issue. A decade ago, in the wake of the global financial crisis, the climate change issue kind of faded into the background. By contrast, today's pandemic seems to have focused the public's attention on extreme global risks and the value of resilience. In financial markets, global issuance of environmental and social governance bonds has exploded in recent years, and it hasn't missed a beat so far in the pandemic. The flow into ESG funds this year is roughly double that of last year. More than one trillion US dollars of ESG bonds are now outstanding. And Canadian ESG issuance has also jumped by more than six times in the past three years, going from less than $2 billion in 2017 to almost $13 billion so far this year. It's crucial that Canadian companies can capitalize on these opportunities. For all these reasons, the Bank of Canada is accelerating its work to understand the implications of climate change and promote a climate-ready financial system. In 2019, we began assessing the climate-related risks in our financial system review, and we developed a multi-year research plan focused on climate risks to the macroeconomy and the financial system. This is a significant priority for us, and it will continue to be so. Climate change, of course, is fundamentally a global problem, so we've also expanded our international engagement. We're working with several partners to develop strategies for mitigating transition risks and promoting sustainable finance. The bank has been particularly active with the Network for Greening the Financial System, or the NGFS as we call it. And we've also been working with the IMF and the Financial Stability Board, among others. It's imperative that the bank is involved in bodies such as NGFS because they're encouraging sustainable finance by developing de facto standards for climate-related disclosures. And it's far better for the bank to be in the room where this happens, bringing the perspective of a diversified, resource-rich economy to the table. Bank staff have made important contributions to the work of the NGFS to promote a scenario-based approach to disclosures of climate-related risks. The basic message is, uncertainty can no longer be an excuse for inaction. Using the publicly available scenarios developed by the NGFS, companies should be able to begin to describe the resilience of their organizations and the strategies uh, they have based on different climate scenarios. The bank is now working to bring this analysis home to Canada. Specifically, we're working to develop climate scenarios that reflect Canada's realities for Canadian financial institutions to use. And yesterday, we had a joint announcement with OSFI about a pilot project involving a number of Canadian banks and insurance companies. The Bank of Canada, together with OSFI, is developing scenarios for institutions to use to explore how their businesses and their holdings may be exposed, exposed to climate-related risks. The project has a few goals. Uh, by developing climate scenarios that are relevant for Canada, we hope to make it easier and to encourage financial institutions to use scenario analysis. We also hope that a common set of scenarios will make the results more comparable. More fundamentally, we hope that scenario analysis will help fin financial institutions better understand their exposures to transition risks and this will increase their confidence in their ability to disclose them. In summary, uh, we're committed to working with the financial sector to promote, the resili pr promote resilience to climate change and a smooth transition to low car carbon growth. Last month, the Task Force for Climate-Related Financial Disclosures released its third status report, and it has some good things to say about Canada and our country's support for implementing its recommendations. But to be frank, we need to pick up the pace. So here's the message I wanna leave with you. Our financial system proved resilient during the global financial crisis, 
and it's been a key shock absorber so far through the COVID-19 pandemic. We need to ensure the financial system is just as resilient in the face of climate change. And in doing so, we need to position Canada to seize the climate smart opportunities that consumers, workers, and investors are looking for. But to mitigate the threat and capitalize on the opportunity, we all need to mobilize and we need to do it quickly. Thank you. And uh, Barb, I'll turn it over to you. Great. Thanks, Tiff. And thanks for the Public Policy Forum and Ed for hosting us today. Um, it's a great pleasure to speak to you all. Um, looking at the attendee list, I, I don't need to outline the potential impacts of climate change on a global basis or in Canada. We are all here because we are concerned and we want to be part of the solution. I think we all can acknowledge that the role of the financial markets catalyzing this transitionary change is nowhere near its potential. Now, finance won't solve climate change, but it plays a critical role in supporting the real economy through a smooth and just transition and fostering Canada's leadership in the shift to a low emission climate smart economy. I'm often asked what is sustainable finance and while there is a formal definition in their report, I like to describe it as channeling the financial sector expertise, their ingenuity and influence toward the challenges and opportunities posed by climate change. As Tiff noted, our financial sector is highly capable of this task. You know, we have a world leading financial system, a well-earned reputation for sound governance, risk management and regulation. So I'm gonna begin by describing the expert panel's final report in a nutshell, and then some of the uh, movement we've seen. You know, first of all, the expert panel, it's a package of practical concrete recommendations aimed at spurring the essential market activities, behaviors and structures behind the mainstream sustainable finance market. The recommendations address both adaptation and mitigation. And we took a systems approach. Multiple things need to happen by numerous players, government, companies, investors, and citizens. The final report's 15 recommendations and sub-recommendations fall under three pillars. Crystallizing the opportunity, building the foundations for market scale, and creating financial products and markets for sustainable growth. Now, pillar one addresses the need to shift Canada's climate change conversation from burden to opportunity. For sound environmental stewardship is absolutely necessary and it's intersecting with market access and sustained competitive advantage. Our recommendations were to encourage all Canadians to see climate change not as a burden, but as an opportunity to build a prosperous, resilient economy. Pillar two focused on the key foundations needed to grow and scale the market for sustainable finance in Canada. These building blocks include high quality insightful data, disclosure, legal clarity, and supportive professional services. And without these sorts of elements soundly in place, sustainable finance will likely remain an add-on to mainstream capital market activities. In pillar three, the financial products and markets for sustainable growth aims at developing and scaling market solutions for identified barriers to change in critical sectors of Canada's economy. So in this category would be clean tech, oil and natural gas, infrastructure, buildings, electricity generation and transmission. So where are we today? So I'd like to take a few minutes to highlight some areas of progress under each pillar. And this list is by no means exhaustive. For pillar one, Let's begin with the Institute for Sustainable Finance at Queen's University, the first ever multidisciplinary and collaborative hub in Canada with a singular focus of increasing Canada's sustainable finance capacity. This institute recently released a capital mobilization plan estimating the specific transition funding required for Canada's key sectors. This research was complemented by reports from the Task Force for Resilient Recovery and Transition Accelerator and others trying to offer pragmatic solutions for building back better. And we are seeing a rise in climate commitments by critical industries, including our energy and finance sectors. And in its July economic and fiscal snapshot, the government committed funding to the Department of Finance and Environment and Climate Change to create a public private Sustainable Finance Action Council, consisting of leadership from both the government as well as the private sector 
And this responded to recommendation three of the final report. Now, under pillar two, much progress in building the foundations for sustainable finance market scale on many fronts. Over the summer, with the support of the Insurance Bureau of Canada, the Smart Prosperity Institute undertook broad consultations for a deeper dive into data issues and highlighted that, was high, that were highlighted in our final report, publishing a collection of potential solutions for bridging the transparency gap. Enhanced climate change disclosures are coming along, but as TCFD's latest progress report showed, there's still much, much more to do. And for its part in the budget 2019, the Canadian government encouraged our crown corporations to adopt TCFD recommendations. And it went on to integrate TCFD into its larger employer emergency financing facility program. CPA Canada continues to work with its partners to develop guidance for incorporating climate change into asset valuations. The legal community has issued papers around the intersection of climate change management and fiduciary duty. TMX, our primary exchange, released its first ESG report, leveraging SASB, launching ESG indices, and continuing to work on many sustainable finance initiatives. And in my discussions with Canadian financial sector associations, they're working hard to provide their members with information, tools, and channels to meet their climate objectives and imperatives, including an exploration of a possible Canada or Canadian Climate Action 100 Plus, a collaborative climate engagement program to bring a unified financial sector voice to Canadian companies. And let's not forget the key strides made by the Bank of Canada embedding climate risk considerations into their forecasting and financial stability monitoring. For pillar three, the, which are target market solutions, a major cross-section of private sector representatives have partnered with the Canadian Standards Association uh, group to develop a Canadian starting transition taxonomy and help spearhead discussions to a global transition taxonomy relevant to Canada. I, I believe the working group in this case is over 65 participants, which is a significant effort in bringing together multiple groups. Otherwise, numerous groups are working to galvanize the solutions posed by Pillar 3, including renewed efforts by Canadian Infrastructure Bank. My sincere gratitude goes to all those who helped move the needle forward with a full appreciation for the time, the effort, and the leadership needed to bring these initiatives and changes to bear. And as we all know, rapid progress and change also continue all around us, and other countries are beginning to establish themselves as leaders in the sustainable finance space. EU is perhaps the furthest along in leveraging its financial system in addressing climate imperatives. The UK continues to implement many of the task force of their task force recommendations, even during their difficult Brexit changes. Last week, it announced plans to develop a green taxonomy using EUs as a basis and mandated TCFD adoption. And as co-host of COP26, the UK plans to take a leading role in sustainable finance discussions, starting with private finance agenda campaign earlier this year. China continue its progress working through the EU to harmonize sustainable finance taxonomy in the 2060 net zero commitment. And Australia next week is going to come together and release its roadmap equivalent of their expert panel report. And meanwhile, there's also been significant developments globally through groups like the Network for the Greening of the Financial System and the International Platform for Sustainable Finance. Now, as a small economy, Canada would be challenged to lead in all aspects of sustainable finance. Yet through our consultations, clear areas of leadership arose, including opportunity to position our financial sector at the forefront of transition financing, designing tailored, evolving solutions for critical sectors. And while efforts to bring finance to climate table are mounting worldwide, significant potential remains untapped. And this reinforces the need to press on, work together, and continue to drive the expert panel recommendations forward while keeping an eye on the horizon and refreshing our roadmap as things evolve. So the bottom line, it's time to position Canada to, to seize the climate smart opportunities that investors, the workers and consumers are looking for while adapting to and mitigating risks along the way. If we're able to achieve either of these goals, we all need to mobilize immediately and with haste. So we're really interesting to hear from the leaders in this room, your suggestions, on how we can do that and mobilize quickly. Thank you, Ed.
Thank you, Barb, and thank you, Chip. And uh, now I'm going to open it up um, uh, to the first questioner. And uh, I would uh, hope that other people will uh, put some questions into the Q&A in the meantime. Uh, and uh, let's start the first question, which is from Bruce Lurie of the Ivy Foundation. Great. Uh, thank you very much, Ed. And um, hi, Tiff and Barb. Thanks for the wonderful remarks and all of your work on this. Um, I guess my question is, given um, uh, the assumption that most people are making that Biden will be the next president of the United States, um, how do you see uh, his $2 trillion clean energy and clean check, uh, tech agenda uh, with respect to our competitiveness? Do you think we'll be missing out on foreign investment opportunities? Are we at risk of losing talent or IP to the US? Or is this really a great opportunity for Canada to access those markets with, uh, with our, uh, our technology and innovation? Um, well, I'm happy to start if you like, and, and Barb, you can, you can add. Uh, I guess I'd offer a couple thoughts. I mean, Bruce, you know, as I mentioned in my remarks, uh, you know, consumers, workers, investors uh, are increasingly, increasingly they care about the environmental footprint of what they buy, where they work, what they invest in. And, you know, that's happening in Canada. It's happening in Europe. It's also happening in the United States. And my, my first bit of advice would be uh, don't underestimate the United States. There's, there's already been a lot happening at the state level in the United States. And we know from history that when the United States uh, focuses on something, they can bring a lot of ingenuity and a lot of resources to bear. And that could certainly increase the competitive pressure on uh, Canadian firms to accelerate their attention uh, to, to climate change issues. But the other side uh, of it, which, which you uh, mentioned, um, is that I think there is the potential with a Biden-Harris administration for a more integrated and more rational North American approach to climate change. Uh, you know, our economies are, are very integrated and I think a more integrated approach would be uh, good. Uh, I, I, I would imagine that's something the business community would welcome. And indeed, I would encourage the business communities on both sides of the border uh, to take advantage of our historical links and work together uh, on these issues. So I think there, there, is, there, there is some risk, but uh, there is also an opportunity. Yeah, I think that's a great answer. So I'll um, save time and maybe go to the next question. <laughs> so if you, um, if you happen to uh, also answer one after Chip has spoken, we will um, infer that it was not a good answer. Okay. <laughs> okay, our second question is going to come from uh, uh, Don Fogeron of the uh, Insurance Bureau of Canada. Don? Thank you, uh, Ed, um, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Barb, Tiff, it's great to see you both. Tiff, congratulations. Haven't seen you um, in some time, but the last time we spoke, we were talking, uh, we were at a at a discussion uh, very much germane to, to today's. Um, uh, first of all, congratulations on yesterday's announcement uh, that you alluded to earlier between yourselves and, and OSFI and the launch of uh, the pilot project. We certainly look forward to uh, hearing the, uh, the outcome of that important work uh, next September. My question uh, that I do want to ask is in light of, of announcements that we recently heard from the UK and a bit before that in New Zealand, uh, their intention to move forward with uh, mandatory climate-related disclosure. And I just wonder if your perspective has shifted at all uh, on sustainable finance and climate uh, disclosure since you've become governor and in light of these, uh, these announcements uh, in these other jurisdictions. Well, I'll, I'll start here and, and invite Barb to come back. And our, our uh, expert panel report did have some recommendations on disclosure. But in, in terms of, uh, uh, yes, I, I, I'm sitting in a different seat now. And, um, you know, it, it was a little easier as uh, chair of the expert panel and dean of the Rotman School to go around and tell everybody else what to do. Uh, now, as governor, uh, I'm conscious uh, and I'm very focused on uh, what the Bank of Canada needs to do. And what 
what also what we need to do to help the financial system to do what it needs to do uh, to uh, address these issues. Uh, I think you know, to, to come at your question a little more broadly, um, you know, the, the remit of the Bank of Canada is, is monetary policy and promoting the stability and efficiency of the financial system. Um, there are many parts of climate change that are well beyond that, uh, but and, and and so those are, you know, I'm going to leave those things to other people. But within the things that are in our domain, um, I do think it's going to be important that uh, the Bank of Canada uh, accelerate the pace of what it's doing, uh, and together with the financial system, uh, we accelerate the the management of climate risks and the flow of capital to climate smart investments. Uh, you know, my remarks, I outlined uh, a few elements. Uh, disclosure is certainly an important part uh, of being able to assess those risks. And if you can assess the risks properly and you can price them, that's going to improve uh, the allocation of capital. And um, the the announcement yesterday to uh, on this pilot project to uh, develop Canadian relevant scenarios is you know an important step uh, towards uh, improving uh, that that um, the assessment of, of transition risks. Uh, it's one step. Um, you know you're you're going to see more steps, and I would just underline you know this is a journey, uh, and uh, you know my message is. The Bank of Canada wants to work with the financial system to make sure it's climate ready, and that includes, uh, you know, both investments in uh, adaptation to climate change. As you're very well aware, in the insurance business, uh, you know, some of the some of the consequences of climate change are already irreversible. We're going to have to adapt to them, and it also investment includes important investments in in transition to uh, low carbon growth. Barb, do you want to say a few words about the disclosure in the report? So in the extra panel report, maybe I'll clarify, um, we recommended that we should go to a mandatory comply and explain framework. So we really encourage that it be broad based uh, and uh, acknowledge for when companies who don't believe it has significant effect have an opportunity statewide. Um, if I look at SASB, they would say, you know, climate change would be relevant. I think it was like 72 out of the 77 subsectors that they look at. However, we also put the proviso in that we think we thought it should the expectation should be phased. You know, start with the um, perhaps more qualitative items, um, much of the governance area in terms of how do you govern about climate change risk and opportunity in your organization. Begin the articulation of the strategy of your organization and how do you think about the risk management processes. And then work toward some of the harder items um, over a period of time, which around setting metrics and targets um, and disclosing relative to those and having more articulation about your company's processes um, in there. And lastly, it was the scenarios um, for the sheer reason of um, the work that Tiff mentioned in terms of trying to provide these Canadian scenarios that then companies could build off of. So that's really important work is the starting for the scenarios. We also try to accommodate the fact that, you know, Canada has a lot of smaller companies than many other countries. And so really the leadership around PCFD can uh, be advanced by larger companies and we should manage our expectations that will learn, learn from the larger company disclosures and give them a bit of extra time. So very much um, still support that recommendation as long as these people will manage their expectations that this will be a learning process and a journey for, for all groups. Okay, thank you. And then uh, uh, the next question comes from Rosemary McGuire from CPA Canada. Thanks, Ed. Uh, hi, Tiff. Hi, Barb. Um, so the expert panel report, as you just noted, talked a lot about task force on climate related financial disclosure recommendations and the momentum is now shifted to calls for an international global sustainability standards board. And the IFRS Foundation, uh, which sets uh, financial reporting standards, has a proposal, an open consultation right now, proposing whether they should proceed and um, develop uh, a global sustainability standards board. So my question for both of you is, 
Uh, is there a need in your view for global standards for measuring and disclosing sustainability performance more broadly, which obviously would encompass climate and uh, with the proposal by the IFRS, IFRS Foundation uh, adequately address that need? Yeah, well, maybe this time and I can start. Um, I've read the consultation paper and um, IFRS Foundation is looking on creating a sustainability standards board to complement the work that they do on traditional county metrics. And I think when you stand back, um, maybe some context, when you look at TCFD, you know, it has gotten world recognition because it was really supported by the Financial Stability Board. Right, really strong backing. A lot of the other standards that are out there, and there's numerous, is um, private groups, um, not-for-profit type associations who are working incredibly hard to develop these standards, but there's a, an array of them. And it's obviously a confusion point for a lot of um, issuers, um, which I heard as the um, head of SASB Investment Advisory Group. They just wanted clarity of what investors wanted, what people cared about. So I think, you know, it's hard to say, no, it's not a good idea. However, I think that, you know, when I look at the consultation, I would say that, you know, they really need to think about this in a pragmatic way, build off what we have already built, um, groups like SASB, um, GRI for the Global Reporting Initiative and TCFD and build from those. And every action that they need to do really should need be thought in the frame of how can we add clarity um, and help speed this up. So don't start over, it would be my, my view. Build off what's there. Um, and I think that's a really good opportunity for many of the people on this phone call. Their consultations are um, until the end of, somewhere around mid-December. So really great opportunity for this group to um, look at their consultation questions and give them the feedback for, as investors, or issuers, um, what is needed, because this will be a very timely conversation for them. If are you uh, want to add in there? I, I don't have much to add other than to say, uh, I have two CPAs in the family and they really think that a mere economist should not be account uh, commenting on accounting standards. But uh, the I, I will say that, um, as we all know, what, what's get, what gets measured gets managed. And uh, there is a real value in having an agreed upon measurement system. Uh, and then the other element of that, of course, is verification. And that's where the auditors come in. Uh, and you know, the accounting bodies, the accounting system is a core piece of infrastructure we need uh, for this whole thing to work. And I, I've been uh, you know, very encouraged by uh, the work and the research that CPA Canada has been doing. And I think Barb, Barb gave you some, some very good advice. So I will, I will just lean in and support that. Okay, I'm uh, gonna go uh, to uh, some of the written questions on, on the Q&A. And I should say uh, that I think you guys also have access to the Q&A if, uh, if you uh, if while the other one's speaking, if you want to peruse it, if there's something that particularly is attractive uh, uh, to your curiosity, um, that would be great. So, yeah, you know, I'm going to start. There's a number of questions uh, that are on uh, reporting standards. Uh, one of them from Teresa Redburn asks about, uh, talks about a divergence that is occurring uh, in her view in, in, rather than a convergence or consolidation on, on a very few standards, rather companies are, are seeing more standards and is looking for some um, view of what you think are the most likely or leading frameworks uh, for disclosure. Um, other questions in the same uh, vein are, uh, and I think you've already just sort of probably dealt with this in any case, is has Canada um, uh, already moved into a position where it can't uh, uh, forge independence or leadership uh, uh, in this way. And another question that touches on examples of uh, reliability and uh, you know consistent and comparable quantitative um, uh, material that would support uh, um, the uh, the standard. So, if um, if you want to take an attempt at that, and then I'll move to the next cluster after that, which will be oil and gas. So uh, uh, this one, it might be the easy one. Barb, you want to start? 
Sure. So if I think I, if I understood the question correctly, whether there's some standards and, you know, I think on the climate, so let's differentiate a little bit between frameworks and standards. I think TCFD is a great framework to lay out how you should report on your climate change risk. Right? It talks to governance, uh, strategy, risk management, and metrics and targets. And so it helps you organize information and they provide some guidance on the types of information that you should be reporting around carbon emissions. And then there's standards out there. And I would say today, um, SASB, which is the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board, has, I believe, about 55 large global institutional investors now part of their group with, I think, about over 40 trillion USD saying, please use SASB. It is the minimum that we would like for a view into your financial materiality. So SASB's lens is all about financial materiality. And so it's a really great place to start. You would often hear saying to supplement that with a carbon disclosure project for more detail. And then I think if you're looking for broader stakeholder reporting, something like the Global Reporting Initiative is often used and seen as a standard. Um, on all these standards um, provide, especially SASB, great detail on how to calculate things so that they're comparable because that's at the root of the process. Um, we heard many times, and I think this is not, is a broad problem, um, is in carbon disclosure in particular, you know, there's understandable ways to do it and protocols, but often what's not disclosed is how much and to what extent of your footprint are you actually disclosing? And that could be provided qualitatively to help the investor. And so the, you know, all those things are out there and they're great places to start. And then I would talk to your shareholder community um, as well in terms of what they're looking for. Uh, I'll, I'll just add a couple of things. You know, as Barb underlined, uh, TCFD is a very useful framework and you are seeing uh, some convergence globally around TCFD. And then as Barb underlined, there's a lot of pieces of that that have to actually get worked out to implement that framework. Uh, and the, the announcement we made yesterday with respect to scenarios was very much part of trying to work out one of those pieces. One of the things Barb and I heard consistently on the expert panel, and we've heard a lot at the Bank of Canada, is it's, these scenarios are really hard. Uh, they require a lot of assumptions. And, and if, if everybody has to develop their own scenario, it's going to be very inefficient, and there's going to be a lack of comparability. And so it's really in that spirit that the Bank of Canada and OSFI are working together with uh, Osby and the bank and are working together with in a pilot project with uh, six uh, Canadian financial institutions to th develop those tools around, develop those scenarios and some tools to measure and some methodologies uh, to to try to make this easier for everybody. And then the idea is it'll, it'll roll out more broadly. Um, and with respect to, uh, you know, is it too late for Canadian inter uh, leadership at the international table? Uh, absolutely not. Uh, Canada, Canada. it's important that Canada's voice is at the international table. We, we're a large resource rich economy. We're not the only resource rich economy out there. Uh, and it's important that, you know, we, we get a smooth, uh, rational, sensible uh, transition uh, and you know, that's got to be embedded in our uh, international taxonomies. Um, it, it's got to be embedded in international standards. So it's, it is important that Canada's voice at the table. And, you know, obviously we're not the biggest country in the world, but uh, you know, we're a G7 country. Uh, and, you know, we do our homework. We come with good ideas. Uh, we make some friends at the international table. We, we can certainly be effective. We've demonstrated that in the past and we can do it again. Okay, um, I think uh, before I go uh, to oil and gas, I'm going to just try a couple of other things first. And I, I feel um, duty bound uh, by uh, solidarity principle to go to question by my former Globe and Mail colleague, Sean McCarthy. Uh, so um, uh, here it is. We heard last time about transition finance taxonomy. I don't know what last time refers to, but we heard last time about transition finance taxonomy and the, <coughs> the Made in Canada framework. Can you comment on the task force's conclusion in this area and how transition finance taxonomy differs from and will work with sustainable finance taxonomy? That's, that's yours, Barb. <laughs> so, um, so let's start with what typically is referred to as a green taxonomy. And 
when you look at Europe, who typically uses the word green, but gets interchanged with sustainable finance, you know, they have many criteria. Um, one of the criteria is all of six is climate change mitigation, for example. And what they're looking for when they want to give something the label of green is provide, it must provide, this activity must provide a sustainable contribution to climate change mitigation, net zero by 2050, or at least 50% reduction by 2030. So if you pull this down, it's posted on the internet, and you search for the word oil and gas, you're not going to find very much, right? You find it around hydrogen, perhaps. And so it's really talking about what will be in existence in 2050, and let's fund that through green financing. Um, where we came at with the transition financing in the expert panel was, okay, but a lot of things need to happen as we reduce our footprint that maybe... Um, we don't know what form they will be in, in 2050, but we know we have to improve or lower the emissions. And so what could those activities be? And it could be investment in certain types of clean tech to lower emission standards, perhaps not as much as the to get to what would be denoted as green. And so that's really the work that I would really compliment. Um, I think there's over 65 participants being led by Peter Johnson of Scotia and the Canadian Standards Association in trying to develop. And I understand it is they're trying to produce some guidance by February of what this will look like. And so it would, you know, the transition finance is a really great opportunity where an example where Canada could lead. As a resource-based country, you know, we've reported a lot of advantages from that. And there's a lot of resource-based countries like Australia, for example, who actually are gonna come up with their roadmap next week. So I'm really interested to see what they'll talk about around transition as well. And this could be where Canada can take a leadership role is in defining what are these transition activities that should be financed. Jeff, I have one, I think, specifically for you. Uh, it, uh, it notes that uh, there have been announcements by central banks recently, uh, the Dutch, uh, the English, the French, uh, related to climate change risk, and then Canada yesterday. Um, are central banks speaking and coordinating, and to what extent? Yes, uh, there's there is increasing, uh, you know, as I said, you know, this this is a global phenomenon. It's a global problem. Uh, attitudes are shifting in every country, and um, we are increasingly we're 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 all, uh, I would say, uh, accelerating the pace of of, of our uh, focus in this area. And yes, we are. Uh, talking um, certainly the the network for greening the financial system the NGFS uh, has been a very important um, network for like-minded central banks um, and it it uh, continues to grow as more central banks uh, as well as other um, you know supervisors and other uh, parts of the financial regulatory system join uh, that's been very helpful. And, and it's helpful in a few ways. One is we don't have to each rediscover uh, the same thing. Uh, there's also real benefits in, in pooling our data. One of, one of the things that's, that's very different about climate change compared to many uh, you know, financial issues we deal with is that um, the future is not gonna be like the past. You can't use historical uh, you know, delinquency or, or uh, default rates as a predictor of what's gonna happen in the future. Uh, we have limited uh, data. Uh, we have limited data on when you do have things like, say, green mortgages, do those have different default um, characteristics? By pooling our data, uh, we, can, we, can move, we can move more quickly. So there is a fair amount of uh, coordination going on and sharing of information, and I expect that that is only going to uh, continue and accelerate. Okay. Um, uh I want to get a few more in, so I'm, I'm going to go to the oil and gas for a moment. Uh, one of the questions was, uh, given the scope and scale of Canada's oil and gas sector in our economy, are we more vulnerable to economic shocks compared to other countries because a huge national asset base is locked into a carbon heavy energy system? And then another one of those questions is, we have a significant challenge with transition as it relates to the oil and gas sector, which is taking hits on a number of fronts uh, the rest of yours um, uh, on price fluctuations, economic impact in uh, Western Canada and COVID, 
Any thoughts on how Canadian oil and gas can play a role in the transition going forward? And then finally, a question on uh, how do pipeline, LNG terminals, refineries, and similar investments fit into a stable investment strategy? Yeah, Barb, why don't you go ahead again, and I'll, uh, I'll, I'll come back after you. There's a lot in there, and so... Um, but it, it, it allows you, it allows you um, uh, to pick the ones you like and just uh, ignore the other one. <laughs> So, you know, um, in many presentations, I used to note that, you know, Canada's overweight carbon in the world that decided that it wants to reduce the amount of carbon it uses. And so, you know, when we positioned the report, we absolutely thought of it in terms of Canada's future prosperity, its competitiveness, its business landscape. And, you know, the fact that, you know, many of the products that we make and probably make the safest and cleanest way in the world are maybe less in demand going forward. And so absolutely there is a competitiveness concern for Canadians. Um, in terms of uh, what we can do, not my technically area of expertise, but I can say there's been some great initial work by groups like the Task Force Resilient Recovery in terms of how we could invest to become, build back better, transition accelerator that talks to hydrant. And so I think there's been a lot of uh, efforts around small aspects to it. But one of the main things that we talked about in the expert panel was really sitting down with industry, financial players and government to say, what are these pathways for these current sectors? What are the investments that need to be made? What are the policy changes that need to be happened? And again, an area that I would encourage everyone to say like, how do we contribute to that conversation um, and build and build a consensus view um, in terms of what Canada needs. Yeah, I mean, look, I'll, I'll just add, uh, we, you know, as Barb, where Barb started, we, we are a carbon intensive economy, so we are more exposed. Uh, and, you know, that's a reality and, and we, need to, we need to address it. Uh, but having said that, you know, we, we have a number of advantages. Uh, we have tremendous innovative capacity in this country. Our oil and gas industry has been a very innovative. And in driving down the price of extraction, it's because energy is a big input into extraction. It's at the same time uh, driven down the CO2 emissions per unit of extraction. I mean, that, that, that innovation needs to uh, continue. We have a world-class uh, financial system. Uh, and, you know, at the end of the day, um, we're, we have a Canadian pragmatism, uh, we're, we're a big, uh, we're a big country in landmass with a lot of resources, but we're, we're not uh, that big in population, uh, and we have an ability to work together and, and, uh, address our problems. Uh, we've, we've done this through history, and I think, you know, as we highlighted in the expert panel report, um, there is opportunity here and uh, we need to seize it. And, and I guess to an earlier question, uh, perhaps uh, one of the advantages we also will have is uh, uh, a greater ability to uh, achieve scale in cooperation with our neighbor to the south. So, um, okay, I, I have a question uh, from uh, our colleague, uh, Stuart LG. Uh, who asks, uh, notes that the uh, Sustainable Finance Panel's number one recommendation was uh, to, quote, map Canada's long-term path to a low-emission climate smart economy sector by sector with an associated capital plan. Uh, and he says, while the government is doing small pieces of this, like the upcoming hydrogen roadmap, it has not yet announced anything that really gets at this recommendation. Can you explain why you made this recommendation to do sectoral roadmaps that look out a 2030, 2050 low carbon economy and how we position Canadian sectors for competitiveness? A so big question. So I can start. Um, Barb, you start. I can start one, one aspect. So, you know, our, our objective for this expert panel was how do we mobilize sustainable finance to super growth? And so what we thought, you know, for investors and being part of the institutional investor community for a long time, you know, you need certain things to be able to do investments. You want policy certainty, absolutely, so that you can manage the risk of your investment. And you want to understand the pipeline of opportunities so that you spend time in investment in understanding which ones would be attractive to you. 
So in terms of mapping out these pathways, you know, right now investors in Canada are having, as part of an organization that did infrastructure investing all around the world, but was very challenged in finding, you know, opportunities in Canada, even though they really wanted to. And so we wanted to say, you know, it would help everybody to get work in the row in the same direction in a way if we mapped out these pathways, get the industry expertise at the table, get the financial sector expertise, the policy expertise at the table and say what needs to be done. A really good example that um, came to light when we were doing the expert panel was UK Wind, and many of you may know it, um, where they decided that that was going to be their solution for, for the UK. Not solar, but UK, offshore wind. And they had a lot of problems. They had technology problems. They had financing problems. They didn't have the right structures around getting the financing and the clarity to the investors. They had technology issues. And so they brought the groups together and said, how do we actually become a leader in offshore wind? And then, you know, I would think, I believe it's quite a substantial portion where it's around a third of their energy sources from the offshore wind. Um, but I will have to go check that. Um, and so that's really what we wanted to drive here is, you know, clarity and where, what investments we need to make establishing what, how much dollars that we may need, may need and the type of pipeline to get investors interested and engaged in helping to finance the solution. Thank you. Anything you want to add to this? No, I, I, think we, I think we laid it out pretty clearly in the expert panel report and uh, yeah, there's some good recommendations there. Okay, I'm going to just ask you both um, uh, as we're wrapping up if there's one final takeaway uh, you would like uh, the participants um, to take away with them. Tiff. Uh, well, I have a suspicion Bar Bar Barb and I uh, are, are going to say something similar. We, we've been hanging around a lot together. Uh, and I, I think one of the things we see is um, and it's only accelerated since the expert panel report was published. There's a lot of activity. Uh, and I think, I think one thing that would be helpful is if it was a bit more coordinated. Um, the, there's, and you know, from the Bank of Canada's perspective, that's, you know, we're, we're trying to coordinate some of the things that are in, in our domain. Um, I think, uh, Barb, Barb is, is doing some work with Department of Finance. Uh, I'll let her talk, say something about that. Um, and then in the private sector, um, have players come together and, and work in, in a more concerted and coordinated way. There is a lot of ingenuity. There's a lot of expertise out there. I think there's a real recognition capital is moving uh, and um, we need we need to move faster. We have the capacity to do it. Thank you, Barb. Yes, yeah, so I'll just add. Um, I'm trying to help with the Department of Finance and Environment and Climate Change in how do you stand up um, the Sustainable Finance Action Council, which they announced in July, economic and fiscal snapshot, and it was our third recommendation in the expert panel. And the reason that for that was really to bring together the market leadership with policy and. Uh, folks like TIFF now in his new role in uh, people from the government to say, what are those solutions that we need? How do we implement the expert panel recommendations? And how do we keep our finger on market insights so we can amend our roadmap? And what are the most important things that we need to address? So the need of bringing the conversation together and prioritize and bring the groups together is a really important one. And I know many of the groups here today are doing really interesting things. And, you know, I would encourage them, um, you know, one, to create help with supporting the creation of this council, but also when they're looking at doing initiatives, you know, who can they work with? How can we build a stronger voice? Um, how can we impact, have a greater impact by working together? Okay, look, I wanna thank you uh, very much, both of you for, uh, for the insights you offered today, for your leadership on the issue, for uh, your uh, plugging away at it and continuing uh, uh, to plug away at what's a very important uh, matter for uh, the country and, uh, I, and the world. And I want to uh, thank everybody who's uh, participated uh, today. Last, uh, lastly, but not leastly, our partners, uh, the Ivy Foundation, the Insurance Bureau of Canada, CPA Canada, and the Canada Infrastructure Bank for uh, your support. Uh, goodbye, everyone, and uh, have a good rest of the day. Bye-bye.